Hey everyone, Ben here. Uh, this is part two of the uh, video series on impedance. Uh, but first I wanted to show you what I've been working on this week. These workbenches. Uh, even though I've been in this shop for about a year, I haven't had a, uh, a good selection of workspaces. So I spent some time building these benches. And uh, I'm actually really excited about this because I've got 20 or 30 feet of uh, linear workspace now, which uh, makes uh, working a whole lot easier. Okay, let's head over to the electronics area and I'll show you what I've got set up today. At the end of the last video, uh, we have, were comparing these two circuits here, this one built with a resistor and this one built with a capacitor. And uh, I left off by saying, well, how, how, asking the question, how is it possible that the capacitor circuit only draws 0.4 watts uh, using this, you know, uh, kilowatt power meter? and yet the resistor circuit draws 2.2 watts, but in both cases the LEDs are about the same brightness, so it seems like we're kind of getting something for nothing here. And, uh, you know, the answer is that the capacitor, if built perfectly, actually is not able to dissipate power. So when current flows through a resistor, uh, it heats up because the resistor is restricting the current flow through there. But that's actually not what's happening with a capacitor. In a capacitor, you know, there's just two plates, and uh, once those plates become charged up and there's an electric field between them, uh, no more current's going to flow. So if, if the capacitor is built with zero resistance parts and the, and the uh, dielectric is perfect, there's actually no way that a capacitor can uh, dissipate power. So you might be thinking, well, I said that the impedances for these circuits are about the same, uh, I chose the capacitor value and the resistor value such that when we did the math, the circuits are almost equivalent. Well, I only uh, gave you half the truth there. It's true that the magnitude of the impedances of these circuits is about the same, but there's another component to impedance, uh, an angle, and that indicates uh, whether the circuit is resistive or capacitive. And, and we're going to get into inductors later, but right now let's just concentrate on capacitors. So to help you see what's going on in here, let's hook this up to an oscilloscope. What I've done here is uh, modified our test setup just a little bit. This is an isolation transformer so that I can connect uh, our, our circuit directly to my oscilloscope and I won't fry the scope or myself. Uh, the trouble with connecting things directly to the wall is that the, the, the um, voltage that comes out of the wall is referenced to earth ground. So if I touched one side of the line, this isn't plugged in right now by the way, if I touched one side of the line um, and that happened to be the hot side of the, of the AC uh, you know, current coming out of the wall and I was referenced to earth ground because I'm standing on a concrete floor here, uh, I could get a nasty shock. And also when measuring stuff with an oscilloscope, one side of the uh, measuring system has to be connected to the case of the oscilloscope, to the metal box that the, you know, the scope is built in. And if you pick the wrong lead, uh, you, you can have a, you know, you can cause a breaker to trip. So using an isolation, or a isolation transformer allows us to connect <clears throat> one side of the line directly to the oscilloscope ground. So let me uh, connect up this circuit here. Let's look at the resistor first. Okay, so the scope is on, and the way it's set up is that channel 1, which is this probe here, uh, is connected across the line. So basically, one side is, is one side of the transformer and the other side is the other side. So it's just going to measure the voltage. And this is a 10x scope probe, so it's going to divide the voltage here by 10. Channel 2 is connected on the other side of this 1K resistor. And what this is going to do is allow us to measure the current that's flowing through this circuit here. So, and I don't have to connect this because I've already got a, a ground reference right here. It would be the same thing as just connecting this here. So we're measuring the voltage across this resistor, which will tell us the current, and we're measuring the voltage across the circuit, which tells us the voltage. Uh, since this is a 1K resistor, if we measure a voltage of 1 volt across here, uh, that means that 1 milliamp of current is flowing, because this is 1,000 ohms. Okay, I'm going to plug it in, hands out, and let's take a look at the scope. Okay. So this is showing us the voltage and current going through the circuit. And um, we're not going to worry too much about units or, or, or making a, um, a careful measurement here. What you should be noticing is that 
the waveforms are in sync with each other. So this upper one here is the voltage, and this lower one is the current. And like I say, don't worry about units or something. We're, we're not going to make a careful measurement here. Uh, the thing to notice is just that they're, they're absolutely in phase. Okay, now I'm going to connect up the capacitor circuit. So I'm going to unplug it here. So now we have something completely different. The voltage waveform looks the same. Actually, see, that has to be the same because we're, we're just measuring the voltage across the circuit. So that's, that's basically the same. But the current waveform is very different. The current waveform is uh, in front of the voltage. So this is known as a leading current form or a current waveform. So as the voltage is coming up, the current is also rising at a faster rate. Uh, and this makes sense. Think about what happens when you uh, connect a capacitor to voltage. Uh, a lot of current flows initially when that capacitor is charging up. And so this is known as a leading current waveform. So earlier I said that I was only giving you half the story with impedance. Uh, not only is there a, a magnitude associated with impedance, but there's also an angle. And the angle indicates uh, the offset between the current and voltage waveforms and also tells you whether the current is behind or ahead of the voltage waveform. So let's draw this out a little bit. It helps to graph it. In a purely resistive circuit, uh, we can draw this with just an arrow on the x-axis, which indicates a uh, purely resistive circuit, and the angle here is zero degrees. In a circuit that has capacitance, we can draw the arrow coming down at an angle here. And the more capacitance our circuit has relative to the amount of resistance in our circuit, the more that that uh, arrow is going to point down into the vertical axis. So what these axes actually represent are real numbers and imaginary numbers. Now, I'm definitely not going to get into the heavy duty math here because um, I honestly don't think it helps your understanding of, of how to use this in practical circuits. But if you're interested in that, you know, let me know. Maybe I'll make a video or you can read about it on your own. The reason that, you know, why not, why not just call this x and y? What's the deal with it? Why choose imaginary numbers? It, the answer is that it just makes the math come out easier. So when you get into phasor analysis and all kinds of other things, when you multiply an imaginary number by another imaginary number, you end up with a negative number, and that's important for the math. But anyway, it's, it's, you can just think of this as resistance on this axis and reactance on this axis. So when you have a capacitor, and when you have a lot of capacitance, that, that arrow is going to be turning down into the, into the vertical axis more. And if you have more resistance, it's going to be closer to uh, the, the x-axis. Uh, what happens if you're over in these two quadrants? What if you're negative on the real axis? That's very unusual. That's negative resistance. And you know, typically it doesn't exist, but in certain weird cases it can exist. That's, if you're interested in that, look up negative resistance. That's a whole other topic there. For 99 point something 9% .9 of, of stuff in the world, you'll just be in these two quadrants with real resistance and reactance. So let me show you how this, uh, this chart relates to um, our, our calculation of total impedance for our circuit here. So I said if we wanted to calculate the total impedance for this circuit, we could use this equation here. And we're going to make the nasty assumption that our LEDs behave like a resistor, which I, I know is not good, but it's a small part of the circuit and it won't make much of a difference. And I, I said that you, know, you geometry guys would realize that this is how to calculate the hypotenuse of a triangle, which is exactly what's going on here. So on the real axis, we have resistance. And in, in our case, it's... 1,000 plus 110. 110 is what we're going to estimate those LEDs to be, and 1,000 is um, the actual resistance from, from our little resistor here. That's the 1K resistor. So on the real axis, we can you know, say that this length here is represented by 1,000 plus 110. And uh, this, this part, which is the imaginary part, is represented by the reactance of our capacitor, which we determined to be 5.6k uh, from, from our earlier equation, 1 over 2 pi fc. Here we are. The equation for reactance. 
So we can put that one here, 5,600. And then you can see that the total, you know, the sum of these, not, I'm sorry, not the sum, the um, combination of these is the length of the hypotenuse here, which gives us the total impedance. So let me show you how this uh, impedance chart relates to uh, power factor and volt amps and watts and all that stuff. It's actually a very similar looking chart. Uh, instead of real numbers and imaginary numbers, we've got watts, which is real power, and volt amps, which is reactive power on the y-axis here. So uh, let's, let's look at a couple examples. Let's say you plugged uh, just a 100 watt light bulb into your outlet at home. Uh, the, the light bulb essentially is purely resistive. It has no reactance to it. It's just a plain resistor, pretty much. So we would plot that on this graph by just going straight across on the real power um, axis, watts, and we'd plot out 100 watts, no problem. Just one, one line on the graph. But if we plugged in our circuit like this, which has a reactance to it because of that capacitor, we have to plot uh, this angle here, just like we did on this graph. So we come in like this, and our, our uh, vector here has magnitude in both axes. It has watts and volt amps. The watts, or the real power, is a measure of how much uh, p power is actually being dissipated in our circuit. Volt amps just measure how much uh, electrical energy is being pushed back and forth between the power company and your device. So if you take your, a capacitor and just plug a capacitor straight into the wall, every time the 60 hertz cycle changes, the capacitor dumps its energy back into the power lines. So what's happening is there's a transfer of power from the power company, the generator, wherever it is, or the power substation, into that capacitor. The capacitor doesn't lose any energy because there's nothing in there that can dissipate if it's perfect. And then the power just goes back to the power company on the next cycle. So in theory, nothing is lost. And you could think of it as, you know, imaginary power because it's actually not being consumed. It's just being pushed back and forth. So in a perfect world, that would be great. No problem. Just pushing power back and forth is, uh, is free. It doesn't, you know, we're not losing anything. But in the real world, um, you know, wires have resistance to them. And so the power company would be very unhappy if, if all loads were, had high um, imaginary power draw because uh, they would be losing power and all of that pushing back and forth. So the power company would prefer power um, to be delivered in watts only. And, and so this is where power factor comes in. So the hypotenuse is known as apparent power and uh, the vertical axis or the vertical component of it is known as reactive power. And the power factor is the ratio of real power, P, divided by the apparent power. Uh, so having a high power factor just means that this, this angle is very slight and that most of the load is resistive. Having a low power factor means that this angle is large and it could be, uh, you know, in the negative, in the lower quadrant here, or it could be up here too. So all this time I haven't really been talking about inductors, uh, I've been concentrating on capacitors, but inductors be, uh, perform a similar function. They limit alternating current flow, but sort of in like um, the opposite way. So capacitors are down here in the lower quadrant, and the current, as we saw in the oscilloscope, leads the voltage. Uh, inductors are basically exactly the opposite the current lags the voltage, uh, but you can treat them in the circuit almost the same way. I mean, you can use them to limit current. We could have built our little circuit here with, in, instead of a capacitor here, we could have put an inductor there. Okay, so I've connected up the circuit. I've taken that isolation transformer back out, so we're powering the circuit directly from the, um, the watt meter here, and it's drawing the 0.3 or 0.4 watts that we saw last time. If I switch this into power factor, the power factor is only 0.15 about, according to this. So let's see if that agrees with our calculation.
Okay, so here we go. So we knew that power factor was the uh, real power divided by the apparent power. So uh, what we can say, since the voltage is um, constant in this circuit, what we can do is just compare the, uh, the real and reactive components of the uh, impedance. So what we can say is uh, our estimated power factor should be something like 1110, which is the real component, divided by the uh, apparent, or sorry, by the, yeah, yeah, the apparent, the total power here, including the reactive parts, which we calculated over here to be 5.7K, so 5,700. So that comes out to be uh, 0.19. So, you know, pretty close. We measured 0.15 calculated 0.19, we're, we're definitely in the right ballpark here. Um, let's take a look at the resistive circuit now. So we're measuring power factor again, and as you can see, the reading is fluctuating a bit. In theory, this should be one. Uh, I said with a, a purely resistive circuit, uh, the power factor should be one, and the current and the voltage will be in phase together. Now, the reason that this is probably not showing one on the meter is because this resistor that we're using, this 5.6K resistor, is probably a wire wound resistor, and that wire winding in there causes it to have inductance, and thus reactance, and then every time you have reactance of some sort, uh, the power factor is not going to be one. So unfortunately, I don't have a, uh, an LCR meter where I can actually measure the inductance of that part. That would be interesting to find out. It looks like our reading is, is you know, about 0.9 on average. Uh, another problem that we're having is that this circuit draws so little current that this meter is really straining to, um, to come up with a reading. And the way it gets this reading is basically by doing what we did with the scope. Uh, it measures the voltage and current waveforms and figures out how much of a difference in phase there is and whether the current is leading or lagging. So it doesn't, it doesn't tell us you know, whether it's leading or lagging, it's, it just gives us the, um, the angle, basically, and, and we have to know from our circuit whether it's capacitive or inductive. From a consumer standpoint, uh, you actually don't really care about power factor all that much uh, because your, your watt meter on the side of your house that, that measures how much electricity you have to pay for only measures watts. So it, it would be a little bit uh, strange for a power company to charge you for imaginary power, right? Because that power is just going back and forth between the power company and your house. You're not actually using that power. Uh, it's actually the power company themselves that care about getting the power factors high, because as I said, you, you lose power in the power lines. So that's actually a loss on the power company's side, not on the consumer's side. It won't show up on your bill. So for residences, you know, there's really not much going on. I mean, basically the power company encourages uh, electronics manufacturers to build things with high power factor, but there's not, you know, they, they don't come out to your house and measure your power factor. However, they do do that for uh, large industrial places. If you set up a factory, I think the power company routinely comes out to measure the factory's overall power factor. And if it's too low, the power company will insist that you install uh, devices to increase the power factor. And in a, in a factory setting, almost all the loads are like big electric motors, which are inductors. And the way that you can increase the power factor of a motor is to put a capacitor across it. So as I was saying, if, if a capacitor is below the horizontal axis and an inductor is above, what we can do is actually add a capacitor and inductor to make this to, to bring this arrow back down to level, which, which would make the power factor high, or as close to one as possible. So the most common type of thing you'll see for power factor correction is a capacitor strapped onto the side of a motor. And that's very often just to counteract the uh, inductance of the motor windings and increase the overall power factor. All right, well, I hope that was helpful. I think this pretty much does it on impedance. Um, no, actually, I take that back. I think I'll do another one on impedance and talk about um, coaxial cables and impedance matching and that sort of thing. Uh, let me know if you guys have any specific questions or anything, and I'll, I'll try to address them there. All right. See you later. Bye.